Hello once again everybody and uh, welcome back to the latest edition of PestaQuest. I know it's been a while but, you know, uh, let's see whether or not the discourse over fucking Tavros on Twitter is um, deserved or not because people for some reason, because Tavros has a fairy uh, poster in the background of his promo fucking thing says, hmm, he's a chaser. And I'm like, what? Anyway, glimmering gold and cold iron. I really hope the iron doesn't have to do with Visca because we don't want to see him get abused. Oh, I love this. Is, is this, uh, is this Bronze Rebel? I'm sure this is Bronze Rebel. Uh, Bronze Rebel. Yes, I love Bronze Rebel. What is uh, Aradia's theme? Yeah, it is. It is what? I don't know. You're enjoying a brisk head-clearing walk in the Alternian moonlight. I hope this cursor isn't being captured. Um, when the plot comes screaming toward you. Literally, you don't even have time for introspection. Ah! <laughs> you turn your head to see a guy in a wheelchair whizzing down a nearby hill. He's got a phone in one hand, making it difficult for him to control his descent with the other. You quickly rush over in time to see him hit a rock and go flying through the air with an impressive arc. Ugh. You bring the fallen wheelchair over to him. He stares at you for a second and then pulls himself back into it with a grunt. Thank you, weird and ugly alien stranger. Once he's settled into the chair, you look over the boy you just helped. He's lanky and scrawny, except for his oversized horns, giving the impression of a boy going through a very awkward puberty. His wheelchair is simple and flimsy and looks like it's gone through a lot of wear and tear. Oh, introductor introductorily speaking, I should say that my name is Tavros. Tavros, as is now useful, usual for you, the name sounds familiar even though you're not sure any of your other friends mentioned him by name. You give him a proper greeting and then ask what happened, and he nods towards an old watchtower on the top of the hill. I was attempting to scale toward the tower to acquire a rare Fidus Bongo monster, what is named Wolverpine. Wolverpine. It's ranked Aether Mystic Triple Rare Class, which is one of the rarest of them all, at least concerning monsters that can be found in lower blooded neighbourhoods. But it appears to be tragically out of my reach, no matter how much I believe in my ability to pursue it. You don't know what a Fidu spawn is, but maybe you could help. You've wrangled a few monsters in your time. What? You know, you could help push him up the hill. Maybe fight some giant horrifying beast, the usual. Wow, I normally am expected to do everything myself, always. The only trolls who offer me help are those who live too far away to actually do anything of consequence. Which is fine, I get it, but it's pretty useless to me. Anyway. No. What? I don't want your help. On account of if I take it, I will be weakening myself and failing to grow as a troll. I'll just have to try again and again and get grievously hurt in the process, probably. Don't worry. Tavris begins to wheel back towards the hill. You know how this story goes. You'll have to spend your entire evening convincing this poor troll boy that it's okay to accept help for others. You launch into a gentle pitch about how help from a friend can... Oh, uh, well, if you say so, then I accept your help. Oh, that was easy. You follow Tavros up the hill. When he reaches the steepest part and his wheels begin to lose traction, you step in behind him and give him the little push he needs. The two of you are successful in scaling the hill, and Tavros grins and taps at his phone. Oh, it's a phone game? No real monsters involved? Holy shit, this is new to you. Yes! Wol Wolver Wolverpine is now acquired. Thank you so greatly. Maybe the cartoons for Wigglers were right all along, and friendship is truly the greatest source of power to exist. Finally, someone who gets you. You ask if he wants a quick ride home, and he tilts his head in confusion. I already have a ride. Always. I'm sitting in it. Not like that. You tell him it's hard to explain. Just trust you on this one. Okay, let's go. With that, you grip his chair and focus your energy, and zap on over to his hive. Whoa, you magic? Yes. Awesome. Do you know any fairies? No. Shucks. Tavros glances around the room and you follow suit. Your eyes settle um your eyes settled an advertisement for the theatrical run of Pupa Pan. A pinch of special sardus is all it takes to fly, bought to you by her Imperious Condescension's nineteenth favourite theatre company. Reserve seating for high bloods, hecklers will be cold. 
The rest of the room is rather plain and spa- sparsely decorated. The room is scattered with messy gaming supplies. So, uh, this is my hive. What do you think? Would you characterise this pad as sufficiently cool? You glance at a framed picture of a fey trickster in booty shorts. Sure, yeah, this pad is cool as hell. Excellent, I hoped you would. Your approval is most good to have. (coughs) I thought you might be uninterested on account of me being boring and kind of sad. Mood. Sorry I'm not, like, commentating very much. It's just that... Uh, like, I've got I've got nothing to say right now, but this is a mood. <laughs> Aw, boring and sad kids are your favourite, you tell Tavros. Wait, that sounds terrible. Ignore that. You mean you relish the opportunity to make people less sad? Oh, don't worry then, because I'm definitely sorrowful enough to satisfy <laughs> me. Also, I'm not great at talking either, so uh, we have at least one point of failure in common. Uh, thanks. Tavros flashes you a thumbs up and a wink. He wheels closer to you and one of his scattered cards crunches under a tread and gets stuck, necessitating a bit of finagling. Finagling. You must admit you're a little surprised by the wheelchair. Your experience as an alternate would suggest that their culture is not very kind to the disabled. Oh, it very isn't. There is a long story behind the fact of me being like this. Kanaya says not to talk about it because it hurts my self-esteem. Oh, okay, that's fine. You turn your attention to some of his cards. Perhaps he can teach you- Well, if you insist, I will reveal to you my tragic backstory. (laughs) Me. Me, when I've been friends with someone for two minutes, I just fucking- Everyone is vaguely aware of at least one of my fucking issues. I used to be more of a hardcore gamer who would do the extreme role plays, And I had a friend, or I thought she was my friend, who I did flap with. Oh, you're familiar with flap. You're a flextrous fellow. Oh, they remember my, um, they remember my, um, my class from Visca's Root. Come to think of it, you've got a great flat friend who we might love to meet. Oh, no! (laughs) No, no. (laughs) We're not taking him to see Visca, please. No, no, no. Well, I don't play anymore. Because this old friend of mine did a bad thing to me, resulting in a chain of revenge that was very tragical. Essentially, the story is that I was thrown off a cliff, physically, and became heavily injured, which resulted in my legs not working. Oh god, that sounds terrible. The culprit continues to hassle me sometimes in ways which are supposedly remorseful, but mostly continue to make me feel bad. For instance, trying to make me learn how to climb stairs, or fight better, or telling me I'm useless and awful because I can't. Although she also sent me this four-wheeled device, which helps me to not be cold, so that's nice, I guess. Uh, Although maybe she wouldn't have done that if Kanaya didn't say to. I don't know, she's hard to understand. Sometimes very nice, and other times extremely not nice, and I can't figure out how she truly feels about me. Wow, this girl Tavros is talking about seems like a real piece of work. You sure are glad none of your friends or anything like that? (laughs) Yeah, but maybe it's best to not think about her. Actually, Kanaya was right. Why don't I teach you how to play... Tavros? No, no! No, we don't want Risk around, thanks. Tavros freezes up instinctively. Oh, oh no, that's her. The one who injured me. Oh no, your spy nice is over. You recognise that telltale exaggerated call, but how can this be? How could your dear, sweet, precious friend Friska have done such a horrible thing to- Okay, you know, this tracks. Maybe she'd do- she did do one thing wrong. But why? This isn't like the other kids she killed. You know Friska is violent and volatile. She had to be to survive. But to harass Tavros after the fact- after the fact, instead of just feeding him to a lucis, it doesn't make sense. You feel sick to your stomach. Hey, Tavros. You haven't been answering my messages. We need to talk. Her voice comes from outside the window as it moves around the perimeter of the house. You glance at Tavros's stricken face as you hear the kind of, Keys? She has keys? Fuck, she has the keys to his hive? Ah. No! <laughs> leave, Riska, leave! Tavros groans and leans back in his chair. Riska barges into the respite block and then flees- it freezes up. Oh, hey. Hey, you say with an awkward wave. Riska seems uncomfortable. God, leave! I didn't know you knew the stork. It's a friendship in process. progress. Tavros has told you some things about their past together. Oh, no. No, please. No, we're doing a bad thing by- No. No, Riska's just going to keep harassing Tavros. Please don't. Oh, of course he has. Okay, listen. I know it sounds bad, because it is, and I get that, okay? Come on, we're not going to feel sympathetic for Friska here. Like, I'm sorry to 
Riska sympathizes. Like I respect your right to sympathize with Riska, but I don't sympathize with. I do sympathize with Riska in that she was abused, but I don't think she has the right to continue to harass Tavros. That's my stance on the Risk course, okay? Way back when it was less than a sweep ago, I was part of a flap campaign that went way off the rails, and Tavros ended up getting thrown off a cliff. It was basically my fault. But that's all in the past now. Things are better now. I hooked Tavros up with this sweet wheelchair and everything. It's not that sweet. Shut up, Tavros. I'm talking about how terrible I feel about hurting you. Tavros cringes, and you try to intercede on his behalf. Why is Riska here? All right, I'm here to extend an olive branch. Very magnanimously so, if you ask me. Terezi and I are getting the band back together. Not for Flap, obviously. That ship has sailed. But we're going to whip this planet into shape and we need all the help we can get. You spent enough time moping around uselessly. It's time for some action. You're in, right? Uh, I... no. What do you mean, no? I mean, I don't really want to do anything exciting or dangerous like that. And especially because you're going to be involved, I don't think it would be good for me to also be. Oh, come on. Things are totally square between us, Tavros. We all got hurt. Besides, I'm just trying to help you live up to your potential. You could be somebody. You could finally start living up to your legacy. (coughs) I don't want to be somebody. At least not your kind of somebody. Yeah, Tavros. Woo, speak up, boy. Tough luck, Toreador. None of us get that choice. If nothing changes by the time your rights of maturation roll around, you're screwed. The drones will call you in an instant. Riska turns to you, her eyes wide, her fist trembling. Her frustrated glare barely conceals the desperation beneath. I mean, you agree with me, right? Tavros needs to shape up. He needs us. It's time we put the past behind us and moved on. I'm just trying to help him. She leans closer. It's obvious she wants you to back her up. Oh dear! Ooh. <laughs> okay, let's let's um, okay, let's get this over with inside with Riska first. You can't resist her force of personality when Riska speaks. It just sounds right. No, I, I don't agree. I don't agree. You tell Tavros that he should accept Riska's offer. Hell yeah! See Tavros, my buddy here agrees. Let bygones be bygones. I don't agree. Uh, uh. Tavros shrinks into his chair, small and sad. The two of you just stare at him as the awkward silence swirls like mist around you. Riska clenches her fist and steps forward, but you quickly put a hand on her shoulder and she pauses. Ah, being around here is depressing, and someone doesn't want my help anyway. Whatever, come on, Bolsheviks gang. (laughs) I've had enough bull for one night. Let's go chill out some of my life's boring. I like how they remembered my name. (laughs) I like how she just... Yeah, come on, Bolsheviks gang. (laughs) Like, I don't know, an arcade? Maybe a movie theatre? (laughs) <laughs> do people without a Lucis to take care of e- what do people without a Lucis to take care of even do? You suggest to Riska that you can find out. Together, she beams. Uh okay, bye I guess. Tavro seems conflicted, as though he can't decide whether to be relieved that Riska is leaving or upset that you're abandoning him. You don't really care though, you're going to an arcade. Oh no, I I feel so bad for doing that. I am so fucking sorry. Okay, let's uh, let's not take a side this time because I feel like side with Tavros is like the thing to do. Who do you think you are, a centrist? This is a choice-driven narrative game, and that obviously means having to choose between two equally unsatisfying, mutually incompatible options, which will forever alienate you from the side you did not pick. Try again. Okay, we have to side with Tavros. Which is good, because I, I also side with Tavros. You take a step closer to Tavros, and Riska visibly deflates. Are we trying to... Are, we, are they trying to get us to feel sorry for Riska again? Come on, bullchicks gang. You can't seriously be on his side. Yes, I am! I am! Yes, you can be, and you are. You think you understand now. You see how Riska took her suffering and bitterness and passed it along. You see how under beastly tutelage she learned to sink her fangs into a prey and tell herself she was doing it for her own good. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Woo! God, there will be so many fucking Risker apologists kind of tearing into this route and saying, like, David Turnbull is a transphobe or something. In these two, you see a microcosm of Alternia, of hurt kids hurting kids, until finally the book stops at the kindest or weakest among them. So no matter how much sympathy you have for her, you can't stand idly by and let Risker continue this cycle of hurt. You tell Risker to look at Tavros, really look at him, and ask herself if her help has done anything for him. Isn't this the kind of suffering that she and Terezi want to prevent? Right now, the best thing she can do for Tavros is to leave him alone. Yes! Leave him alone? 
You don't get it. None of you do. If I leave him alone, he's toast. Seriously, how have you not figured that out by now? You've seen what this planet is like. You think we can just swif flip a switch and fix everything over day? He's a worthless loser living in a world that hates losers. And if that doesn't change, he's going to die a sad, pathetic death. And you and Kanai and everyone else, you're just enabling him. When he croaks, it's going to be on your head, not mine. So you'd... Rather hang out with Taros in his make-believe fairyland, be my guest, but some of us are still going to be living here in the real world. Bye, Vriska. You and Vriska spend a while staring at one another. All you can muster is a look of pity, which only seems to incense her further. Her face scrunches up and then goes steely and flat. Her voice is icily calm. You two have your fun. I'm out. Yay! <laughs> Vriska slams the door shut as she leaves. I'm, like, I'm gonna get fucking harassed by Vriska apologists. Uh, look, I don't I don't... Listen, I, I, I acknowledge that Riska was abused, and I acknowledge that it is sad, and I do feel sympathetic for her on that front, but, like, the narrative is right. Like, we don't want her to continue the cycle of um, hurt and abuse. Um, like, we want to help Tavros. Tavros exhales a long sigh of relief. Well, that went pretty well for an encounter with Riska, all things considered. I only feel somewhat terrible about who I am. Slowly, gently... You place a comforting hand on Tavros' shoulder and tell him that he deserves better than this. It's not his fault. Vriska is... difficult. Yeah, Kanaya says that too. I sometimes almost believe her when she does. The room is silent except for a faint wriggling noise coming from some of the balls on Tavros' floor. You don't know what else to say. Would you uh, enjoy playing some Fidu spawn with me, perhaps? As a matter manner of distraction? Oh, fuck yes. <coughs> you... Tell him, let's spawn some fidu, fiduces? Yeah. Your flap experience in inured you to alternian game design, so you're only mildly nauseated when Tavro shows you how the physical version of fidu spawn works. Chitinous purple critters explode from gooey orbs and infest plushies before bursting out in the form of large monsters with more limbs than you're comfortable with. Also, you have a handful of cards which boost their attributes or allow you to interfere with your opponent's monsters. There's a lot to keep track of here. Before too long, the room is full with chittering purple monstrosities and queasy-looking host plushes, on the verge of birthing even more abominations. You are so lost. But you think you're winning. Your creatures appear to be doing a better job of playing on his host plushes and spawning more of themselves. You've got a meter in the corner that keeps going up while his goes down. That's good, right? You think it's good, at least where victory is concerned. But you're more concerned with the de dejected look on Tavaris's face. He doesn't seem to be giving the game his all. You ask him if he's doing okay. No... Oh, okay, he just came out and said it. My fun has been stimmied, I think, by my thoughts about Vriska. He wheels himself over to the window and looks despondently out. I used to like Vriska a lot, you know, and admire her for her many qualities that were good, such as being very confident and having skill at games. But now I just hate her. Or feel like I should hate her, but instead do not feel those feelings. In their place, I feel very conflicted and bad about myself. I wonder if there is something wrong that I can't feel as angry as I should. Or make myself to become strong enough to talk to her properly about my feelings. It's just a big mess. You glance again at the posters lining Tavros's walls. Sprightly fairy girls with confident smiles, long messy hair and blue colour schemes. The resemblance to Vriska is uncanny but superficial. She's never going to be like the girl from his posters. That's just not who Vriska is. But for a sad, hurt boy who likes to dream, she must seem so painfully close. This is a problem too big for you to untangle right now. You need to redirect Tavros' thoughts. You close your eyes and ask your intuition, what should you do? Okay, let's stay grounded. From the darkness, you reach into your muddled memories and catch a glint of cold iron. When you open your eyes, Pupa Pan stares back at you. He would, have, he would have you believe that faith is all it takes to fly, but you think Tavros could use something a little more material. You put a gentle hand on his shoulder and ask him what you would, what you can do to help him spread his wings. His metaphorical wings, that is. It's not like he could ever sprout real ones. The very thought is absurd. Tavros sighs. I just wish I could live more independently, I guess. To take charge of my life and become less under Vriska's thumb. You think Tavros could use some better friends? Real friends? I do have some. Nepeta is very kind to me often. Gamzee and I like to throw down sick rhymes, and Kanaya tries to help with Riska. But there's not a lot they can do when we live far away. And as nice as my Lucis is, he isn't able to help me with all my issues due to his small size limiting him to only moving and carrying small objects to me when I require them. The simple fact is that I didn't build my life <coughs> with hive with the expectation of one day using a four-wheel device to navigate it. Can Tangros move to a, move to a better hive? Could you help him with that? 
No. As a bronze, the stipend I receive is not enough to cover such things. Even this four-wheel device, which is highly basic compared to some high-blood models, would have cost me over a wipe's worth of savings. Few changes are available to me, economically speaking, especially if I want to not alert drones, alert drones to my unsuitedness for troll expectations. You see, if money is the issue, that's not something you can help him with, at least not directly. But you might know who others who can. You tell Tavros that you're going to step out for a moment to fetch a mutual friend. Kanaya! He seems briefly surprised when you return with Kanaya. You guess you don't blame him. This strikes you as a pretty rare pairing, conversationally speaking. Oh, Kanaya! It's nice to see you, in person, unexpectedly. Wow, my hive is terrible looking. Sorry, but hi. You look nice. Yes, I do. How are you faring? Has my advice regarding the construction of an imaginary friend helped aid your self-esteem? Well, I haven't really got to try it yet, so no, it hasn't, I guess. Kanaya suppresses a sigh. Okay. Let, well, let's, let, let's get directly to business. I've bought some materials with which to renovate your hive. Oh, please advise us as to how best to redesign the place to suit your needs. Tavros' eyes water up and he sniffs, leaning forward in his chair. Really? You would do that for me, despite it taking a large portion of time and effort and presumably money as well? I don't really spend my stipend on much besides fabric. And I intend to twist Friska's arm until she offers a portion of her flapping treasure to foot the bill too. And of course I'd do it for you. Any less would be a rejection of my helpful sensibilities. Kanaya says it with a neutral tone and a straight face as if there's nothing remarkable about it, but Tavros nevertheless breaks into a grin. Wow, thanks! Okay, give me some time to develop ideas on how to properly jack this hive up and deliver the most utterly dope and pimped up changes. This is going to be so great! You give Tavros the requested time and then begin the work in earnest. You weren't sure what to expect, but the construction process proves smoother than anticipated. Kanaya brings a set of alien devices which she claims to have borrowed from a seed-welling friend of hers. One converts raw materials into a strange substance that reminds you of fruit gushes. Kanaya fells trees with her chainsaw and feeds them into the machine, and before long you have a trove of the gusher things. The other device expends the gushes to modify buildings. It has a holographic click-and-drag interface much like The Sims played in real life. You find this construction software to be incredibly handy, and also eerily familiar, but honestly you find everything eerily familiar these days. Yes, it's very convenient. Home construction has been an important part of troll culture for as long as history remembers. Most do not know why, although to me the reason is obvious. P preparation for the game which we will now no longer be playing due to outside interference. Wait, she knows about that? Yes. I figured out what was going on a day or two after you visited me, but I thought it prudent not to get particularly dramatic about it all. That was very thoughtful of her. Yeah, I try. Kanaya finishes feeding logs into the first device and begins to manipulate Tavros' hive with the other. Together, you are a clockwork team. Tavros provides directions, Kanaya implements them with her stellar sense of design, and you pro provide moral support by standing around looking cute. Okay, yes. Nudge that shelf over to the left. Yeah, like that. Wait, actually, right. Further, okay, no go back. A bit more, that's almost good, and I'll make it a little tad higher. Yes, no lower. There, there, right there, and... Yes, perfect, I think. Okay, actually, can you go back to where it first was? In the end, it takes until the next day to visit, um, finish construction, which is actually great time. You're expecting to have to zap forward once or twice for the sake of narrative brevity, but with the Alternian build tools, Tavros' hive is swiftly renovated. This actually looks really nice! It is far more spacious than it once was, with ramps and rails aplenty. Under Tavros' guidance, you widened hallways, lowered counters, revamped bathrooms. It's like a brand new house! You don't have a ribbon to cut in celebration, so Tavros summons some d bizarre fidu spawn creature to shoot confetti all around the entrance to the hive. It's all gross and sticky and you hate every second of it, but he's having fun. After that, Tavros spends a while just exploring the hive. He wheels himself through each block, awed by the ease with which he can navigate the space. By the time he returns to his respite block, his grin is radiant. You take it he likes the new place. Oh yes, this pad is now genuinely frigid. It makes me feel more confident, like the world is my Bevolve jewel container. Like I would say to Vriska, Fuck you, I won't do what you tell me, biatch. <laughs> okay, I won't say that probably, but I could. <laughs> Actually, maybe I will say that, as, as well as plenty of other deliriously rude things, which long I have avoided saying. Okay, that's probably enough, you tell him. Kanai is staring icily at him, but he doesn't seem to notice. He suggests that it's a good time to settle down. The sun's going to be rising pretty soon. Right. 
Well, we still have some moonlight. Would you like to stay for a while, can I, and play some games with us? Oh no, that's quite all right. I'm afraid I have duties to attend to at home. I left a dress in the oven. Kanaya blinks and carefully maintains her poise. It's made out of clay, you see. I'm getting experimental. Aw, this is... Aw, this is a bit sad, actually. Like, Kanaya really doesn't seem to like Tavros very much. Oh, that makes sense. Well, goodbye. She smiles at Tavros and shoots you a pointed glance. You take it as your cue to place a hand on her shoulder, concentrate on her hive, and send her back in a flash of light. Once she's gone, Tavros wheels up to you and nudges you in the hip. So, regarding Kanaya, this could perhaps be me, um, me, be me reading the situation, but when I reach deep inside and tap into the marvellous power of the self-esteem, it tells me that I'm very right and smart. Did you see the way she was smiling at me? Oh, no. Oh, no. Kanaya's a lesbian. There are going to be so many people just tearing into Tavros now. Please. Oh no, Tavros, my sweet baby boy. People are going to regard him as worse than Zebra. Oh, Almost, oh no, almost in a way as to suggest amorous inclinations. Oh no. Eh? Eh? He waggles his eyebrows furiously in your direction. <coughs> oh jeez, you tell Tavros that's just uh, what friendship looks like. She's not his type. Trust me, you say. Drat. But oh well, I think there's a saying about this, that the sea has many fish in it. Now that I'm feeling better, I think perhaps I will one day go fishing for a quadrant or two. Well, it's a start. It's going to take some time for this kid to figure out what genuine self-esteem is like. But just like the prospicion clouds part to reveal a brilliant sky and blue, you think Tavros is on the verge of seeing the sun. The moon? This metaphor would work better on Earth. Tavros can be more than he is, and he doesn't need to change to do it. When he offers you a smile, there's a spark of compassion behind it that tells you he's already worth the world. All he ever needed was someone to believe in him. And money. He also needed money. So would you like to perhaps celebratorily play a round of, or two of Fidu Spawn with me? I'm feeling much more prepared to enjoy a game, and perhaps think that this time I will proceed to crush you with my incredible might as a Fidu Spawn breeder. Except I mean that in a nice way, like that of a friendly challenge. Uh, if you'll accept. The word friend in that sentence was all you needed to hear. Yay! People are gonna hate Tavros. Anyway, the other the other choice seemed like it would be the right choice, but okay, let's help him fly. From the darkness, you reach into your muddled memories and catch a glint of glimmering gold. When you open your eyes, Pupa Pan stares back at you. Unlike him, you don't have special stardust, but you think you might have something better. You tell Tavros you'll be right back. Sort of. The now familiar Prospician spires greet you. You stroop through the shiny architecture until you find those towers that seem to house the dreaming children. Sure enough, Tavros' dream self can be found in one tower, nestled comfortably, comfortably in a recuperacoon. You poke him on the cheek. No response. You give him a little shake. Nothing. With a sigh, you rear back your hand and slap him hard. Tavros remains asleep. He's practically comatose. Why? This feels so off. Carcat is awake, and Tavros isn't. Something about that is just wrong. It's all wrong. How can you help Tavros under these circumstances? He's got to wake up. Tavros yawns as he rises. Oh, that was weird. As he rises blurrily from his slumber and squints around. He crawls out of the recuperacoon and reaches over to the ramp beside it with an instinctual motion. His hands find no wheelchair and he tumbles over, then quickly rises and realizes with a start that he is floating in midair. Whoa, what? Surprise! You inform Tavros that this is the mystical world of dreams, and that part of the, that is part of the game he was ma supposed to play one day, but now isn't going to. Maybe, probably. You'll be, on you'll be honest, you still don't know exactly how this works. But you do know that this is a land where he can fly. That seems highly improbable that such a world would exist. Or especially that I would be al allowed to enter it and fly freely around with no repercussions. It just seems like a thing that would never eventually happen to me, does it not? But it is happening, you tell him. You prove it by pinching his arm. He flinches. Uh, why did you just assault me? <laughs> it is a thing. Pinching is... Okay, this is a cultural misunderstanding. But the fact that you can feel pain should prove that this place is real, or at least as real as a magic dream world can be. I see. My arm certainly does certainly hurt in a realistic manner, as well as my feelings due to the uncalled for attack from a friendly individual. Oh, for fuck's sake. You tell Tavros to stop worrying about that and start unworrying about how we can fly now. 
Oh yeah! With unsteady movements, Tavros begins to circle his dream room. He holds his hands out as he sails around, floating upwards and then dipping down. He seems to get the hang of it quickly, and as he does, his face cracks into a warm smile. Oh, woo, oh, this feels really amazing! In your invitation, Tavros follows you out the window and sees Prospect stretching before him. His eyes go starry. Can I really explore all of this area? He can, you tell him, probably. Just don't go barging into anyone's houses. Hell, okay. Tavros does loops and twirls, pirouettes around spires, and weaves through throngs of prospicious civilians. He hoots and hollers, the anxious crescendo in his voice nearly absent. The sound echoes among the golden towers and rebounds back at you, a cacophony of childlike exhilaration. You sweep alongside him, buoyed by his excitement, and the two of you begin to race each other around the planet. You run out of energy before Tavros does, but eventually he comes down from his high. He floats lazily beside you, upside down, his mohawk hanging down into his face. His eyes are locked on the sky and clouds, and he's wearing a wide, if oddly blank, grin. Hey, I want to thank you for doing this for me, allowing me to feel this freedom and joy. It really means a lot. You grin and give him a thumbs up. You're glad you could help. <coughs> yeah, me too. You glance up at the clouds. How long have you been out here? You figure it's probably time to head back to the real world. You tell him you'll teleport back and then wake him up. What? Oh no! Don't wake me up, please! I don't want to go back to that life. Oh no... I like to spend my days here, forever feeling blissful and happy for once. You pause. That's not the response you were expecting, although you suppose you should have seen this coming. What about his friends? His responsibilities in the waking world? What happens when the drones come knocking? Well, those are some person questions which I don't care about, though. This is where I am happy and where I belong. That's what you wanted, right? To help me be happy? Right. Then your work here is done. He smiles at you, but you feel like you should smile back. But there's a hint of sadness behind his eyes that gives you pause. It's like he's waiting for you to take charge and tell him off for choosing escapism, waiting for you to make the hard decision he doesn't have the guts to make. But that's not the kind of person you are. If he'd rather spend most of his time asleep, that's good enough for him. Given the planet he lives on, you can't blame him. So you give him a little wave and vanish into the ether of cannon. By the time he woke, works up the nerve to say something, you're already gone. Oh, Poor Tavros. I liked that route, but I think it... I think it focused a bit much on his relationship with other people rather than him himself. I liked the bit at the end where he kind of realises that he has to... He can be a great person without changing himself. I liked it. It was okay. It was great. Thank you, and I'll be back for a Radius route, which is apparently going to be very interesting. <laughs>